Hello, TV historians. Yes, it's 2023, and it's time we talk about Cheers. For it being such a simple show with a welcoming, catchy intro song, well, you know, it's a it's one that, for the most part, we've forgotten about. Nobody ever says anything bad about it. But here at Advanced TV History, we kind of think it's time we take a closer look at the women of Cheers, primarily Carla and Diane. And I think you'll understand why. Now, as some of you know, I'm conducting research for a book. And I write about that research and all of my ideas in my e-newsletter. It comes out monthly. So if you're remotely curious, do sign up at tvherstory.com. So this research that I was working on, I was steered toward Cheers' first season as an example of a workplace comedy that featured a steady stream of toxic remarks, some which would be considered sexual harassment. Wow, that observation stopped me in my tracks, since, to be honest, I hadn't seen Cheers in many, many years. But wait. Wasn't the show's initial premise about the sexual attraction between Sam and Diane? Hmm, in an 80s workplace, few legal lines separated attraction from harassment, even if one person held more power than the other, which, in this case, Sam was Diane's boss. So I decided to watch the entire first season to fully understand how the characters and the attraction were presented to that 1982 audience. So I am not here to give you an episode-by-episode recap. That's for other podcasts. Rather, let's revisit Diane and Carla as characters. We'll celebrate Shelley Long and Rhea Perlman as incredible actors with excellent comedic timing. And along the way, we'll listen to a few moments that serve as reminders that this show, Cheers, was created by men and mostly written by them as well except for Heidi Perlman, Rhea's younger sister. For what it's worth, Heidi Perlman got her writing and producing start on Cheers, writing 17 episodes, and was on the team that wrote The Tracy Ullman Show, 1987 to 1990, one of my absolute favorites. Very, 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 that will be a podcast episode. Rather, Heidi won two Emmys for her work on The Tracy Ullman Show and 11 nominations in all, including one for Cheers. And additionally, of the entire writing team of 60 on Cheers, 16 were women, and many of them are credited with only contributing to a single episode. Cheers ran from 1982 to 1993, 270 episodes. And it was a time when the push for, quote-unquote, strong women characters, and I say that because it's clear that even today, sadly, that remains a distinction that must be drawn in storytelling. I'm looking for a strong female lead character. So you think about dramas like Cagney and Lacey and Dallas and Falcon Crest. There were some very strong women in them. But on the comedy level, Cheers regularly competed with the final seasons of MASH and the family-friendly fare of Cosby and Newhart and Kate and Alley, Family Ties, The Golden Girls, Designing Women, Murphy Brown, What a list. And you know what? Within that list alone, there's a spectrum of character development and roles assigned to some of the funniest women from the 80s. And that's because the women showrunners, Marcy Carsey, who was behind Cosby, Susan Harris of the Golden Girls, Linda Bloodworth Thomason, who created and wrote much of Designing Women, and Diane English of Murphy Brown, well, you know what? They all crafted these strong women characters who had by their very place in life, their status, and the arrangement of the characters, they held power. That's a really important distinction. So in Boston, 1982, barmaids Diane Chambers and Carla Tortelli were at a workplace that over the course of the series, and certainly the first season, was awash in men. Now, I get it. A good comedy is embedded with conflict. And these women, as polar opposites, were often more in conflict than they ever were allied. Diane was educated. Carla, not so much. Carla speaks her mind, whereas Diane spoke in very measured words. They are within a few years of each other age-wise, and yet maturity, it's it's a very different game. So how did they even come to be employed at Cheers in the first place? 
Carla Tortelli, played by Real Perlman, has four kids, or, or is it five? Even she can't remember. In fact, many of her lines reveal her lack of interest in parenting altogether. She's a single mom who appears to be the only source of income for her family. And in season one, we never see the kids, though she occasionally shows pictures. We learn she's worked at Cheers since before its owner, former Red Sox pitcher Sam Malone, quit drinking. So she enjoys a longstanding platonic relationship with the boss, who also is very forgiving of her outbursts, her immaturity, and her opinions. Unlike Diane, Carla is a diehard Boston sports fan, which gives her an opportunity to make fun of Diane when names and games come up. Polar opposite. In watching Carla in the first series, though, you kind of get the feeling like she isn't particularly happy with her life. In 1982, we all knew plenty of people from high school who went straight to work. There was no school opportunity of any sort. In fact, Billy Joel sang songs about these people. It was a different time. A full-time job could cover basic living expenses. So even though her expenses were in fact mounting with this growing family, and we never find out, at least in the first season, who takes care of the kids while she works, she feels supported at Cheers. It's, it's her home. She's allowed to be herself and to work hard. And when she's insulted or jabbed by customers or the occasional twist from Diane, Carla gives as good as she gets. Yes. Look, listen, why do you suppose people come to bars in the first place? Huh? Oh, let me take a wild stab at that one. Perchance to drink? Wrong. Wrong. They get the dad at home. They come here to shoot off their mouths and then uh, get away with it. Listen, in this bar, everybody gets to be the hero. Now, what's the harm? Sam... Any kind of lie is eventually destructive. I was raised and educated to prize truth above all else. This from a woman wearing rubber eyelashes and a padded bra. <laughs> That's a lie. I'm going to need some proof. <laughs> Until Diane walks in the door with her fiancé in the first episode, we only know that Cheers is run by Sam, bartended by Coach, and Carla is the one working the tables. And for the most part, Sam and Coach are not combative or hostile to Carla. It seems pretty humdrum. What's that, you say? Yes, Diane Chambers walked into Cheers in the first episode with her fiancé and who was also then her boss, a famous literature professor at Boston University. And she was the teaching assistant. They were leaving for Barbados to get married when the professor leaves Diane at Cheers to retrieve something from his ex-wife, who didn't live far away. But as Sam predicts after hours pass, Diane learns her fiancé has in fact flown to Barbados with his ex-wife, leaving Diane with no source of income and, frankly, her tail between her legs. Though she's nearly a professional student whose tuition is paid from her trust fund, Diane has never waited a table in her life. She is a fish out of water. She knows very little about drinks, sports, or any of the jargon that pertains to both, which is very much a part of her new work life. She never had to tolerate people who weren't like her, and while she finds aspects of the Cheers crowd annoying, she will also be the first to support them when they do something that she finds endearing. So the more I watched season one, the more I observed Diane Chambers providing or attempting to provide emotional labor to every other character. Only in 1982, we didn't call it emotional labor. Instead, we saw her provide compassion, encourage the skeptics or the bias to put themselves in another's shoes, and she soothed disappointment with pep talks. And before she became sexually involved with Sam or even admittedly attracted to him, she related to him on an emotional level and encouraged him to grow and trust his own emotions. In episode nine, Sam is questioning whether he can remain sober without this lucky bottle cap talisman, which was from his last beer, and he keeps it in his pocket. Diane connects with him, and they become friends and equals at that moment. But on a larger scale, with Coach and Carla and Norman Cliff, Diane greeted them respectfully, she listened earnestly, and she tried so hard to fit in, even after they made fun of her to her face. By mid-season, Diane is a bit more emboldened 
to embrace her own interests and flaunt her knowledge, which, of course, only underscores just how different she is from the rest. But she's new to waitressing and manual work. And in the second episode, Diane has made a remark and Sam retorts, I didn't hire you to be a critic. I hired you to be a waitress. A first season of any long-running series is always interesting as you get to experience the evolution not just of the characters, but of the chemistry and the storytelling. Shelley Long was given equal billing with Ted Danson, and they both perform most of the physical comedy, along with Rhea Perlman. The first episodes, you, f- you sort of see a softening around the edges, and they slowly bring along Cliff and Norm as regulars. But it's interesting that actually most of the episodes included a major storyline that stems from a customer, like a, an almost nobody, a one-time cameo appearance customer. Now, in 1982, this seemed totally appropriate. We have two women waiting tables in a predominantly white male establishment. They are providing service for tips. See the power in equity? In addition to Sam's offhanded remarks about Diane's sexual prowess or her attractiveness or lack thereof, Diane fends off guest star Fred Dyer's groping in episode four. Playing these bits for laughs in 1982, we have to say forthrightly that writers were normalizing for men and women what to expect in a casual bar setting. Gropes, come-ons, invaded personal space, it was all fair game for two women waiting tables in a predominantly male establishment. An episode written by Heidi Perlman focuses on Sam entering Diane into a Boston's top barmaid contest. Diane resists at every turn. She is upset that he did this, and Sam uses it as an opportunity to melt some of Diane's perceived iciness. Ah, yes, I would like to speak to the person in charge of female dehumanization. (laughs) What do you mean, speaking? This is in regard to the Miss Boston Barmaid competition. I am Diane Chambers, and I have something to say about this contest. And all contests like it. I only wish the whole world could hear what I have to say. There will be reporters there from all the major papers. Well, (laughs) I I guess if if a contestant had a, a few things to say, this would be an excellent forum for him. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I am every bit as cute as my picture. <laughs> yeah, thank you. I'll, um, I'll see you at the contest. Hey, Diane. I just have one thing to say to you, and I mean this. You stay in this contest and we're no longer friends. I'm staying in the contest. Wow. Really? <laughs> yes. Hey, Diane, you go to bed with me tonight and we're no longer friends. <laughs> well, I guess you're going to just push friendship so far. It's in this episode, actually, that we start to see Diane's feminist mindset. So she wins the Barmaid of War, but rather than using it as her planned soapbox opportunity, She giddily accepts the prizes. And I have to say, I was disappointed by that. And you have to believe that in those early 80s years, in any given conversation in America, I'm guessing there was never two women who asked each other, are you a Carla or a Diane? The way that not that many years later, they asked the question, are you a Carrie Bradshaw or a Miranda Hobbs? So to the male writers and the showrunners, Carla and Diane may have obviously seemed uh, extreme, but I have to believe that when women watched it, they watched and thought, there but for the grace of God go I. I would rather have my job than put up with what they did. And of course, this was before we all came to realize that Cliff Clavin was the original pre-internet mansplainer. One last observation, listeners, that speaks to what was considered acceptable comedy for the day Think about this. How many lines would Norm Peterson really have if you took away all of his digs about his wife, Vera? 
The overt misogyny to Vera was repeated by the show's creators as they spun off Frasier with Kelsey Grammer as Frasier Crane. In nearly every episode, Frasier's brother, Niles, made hurtful, unnecessary digs at his wife, Maris, about her looks, her sexuality, her weight, her hobbies, relationships, you name it. Was it really necessary for either of these characters to even be married? Wouldn't it be obviously understood that it's okay for them to be unhappily married, and that's why we never saw their face, but that they didn't really have to be quite so outspokenly unhappy and mean? Yeah, well, that's a little bit too much baseball for me. I'm heading out of here. Not me, Cliffy. I'm a real Red Sox fan. I stayed till the very last out. Closing time, Norm. I can't serve you anymore. Not like it's the World Series or anything. <laughs> Yeah, no, wake up, Let's go do something. Huh? No, not tonight, Norm. I gotta be down to the post office in a few hours. Pick up my bag. Mm, I'm gonna go crawl in a bed with mine. <laughs> Cheers was a brilliant show because Shelley Long and Rhea Perlman delivered. And the same can be said of Frazier's Perry Gilpin and Jane Leaves. The writers gave all of these women some of the absolute best lines of the series. But those unnecessary digs stand out today as not just unfashionable. They are downright destructive as words used to also describe other nationalities, sexual orientation, abilities, and the like. And they were all played for a cheap laugh. Now, it's no question that a long-running series like Cheers evolves over time and its creators, James Burroughs, Glenn Charles, and Les Charles, they all deftly delivered quality episodes through cast changes, including the big one, Shelley Long's departure in 1987. So let's talk for a second about Shelley Long and Rhea Perlman and their impact on the series. Long is a graduate of Northwestern University, and Shelley Long had had quite a television and film experience under her belt before being cast as Diane. She earned an Emmy and some Golden Globes for the role, and she maintained her decision to leave Cheers in 1987 was a personal one. You know, I've loved uh, a lot of your films, especially uh, Irreconcilable Differences. Oh, thank you. I'm That's watching, one of my favorites, yeah, you know, too. I was just watching that the other day. And you've been in a lot of big hits, and you've been in some films that didn't do as well. Yeah, and, some flops <laughs> is what you're saying. Uh-huh. Well, yeah. Yeah, well, it seems like when the films that don't do as well come out, there's always some reviewer who says, oh, she shouldn't have left Cheers, and, and they harp on that. Did that ever get you down? And were there ever moments when you regretted that decision at all? No, I've never regretted the decision. I've been annoyed by the comments and the constant caution of, do you regret? Do you ever regret? Do you ever regret? Um, I, I don't, I, you know, I don't regret it. I've said it over and over again. My, my, some of my friends are here, and my husband and my daughter who are all trying to keep their mouths closed. It's, um, I love them, and I like being with them, and I sincerely wanted more time with them, which I got, and um, I'll forever treasure that. Um, I wanted to go ahead and take advantage of the Disney contract, which I had to make movies. I would like to have made more movies with Disney. It it just didn't work. We submitted a million ideas, and uh, I think we got one made and almost got another one made, but not quite. But I'm very proud of the work I did. One of the films I did was True Beverly Hills, um, which Thomas, at yeah. least um, my daughter's friends like. She <laughs> she likes it too. She did, she used to worry when she was little when I fell in the mud that I really hurt myself, and she was bothered by that in the beginning. But you're you're not worried about that anymore, are you? Nah. Uh-uh. <laughs> um, we've gone on great vacations, and uh, I don't know. It just my daughter was just two when I left Cheers, and she's now almost ten years old. And I've been around a little more than I would have been if I had been doing Cheers. So it was a great show, great opportunity. I loved coming back and doing the last episode. But don't ever ask me that question again, okay? (laughs) Okay, thank you very much. (laughs) Native New Yorker Rhea Perlman, on the other hand, graduated from Hunter College in New York City with an acting degree and worked off and on in theater and television until Cheers showrunners Glenn and Les Charles were familiar with her work and they were fashioning Carla Tortelli and they knew she was it. She appeared in every episode and Rhea Perlman won Emmy Awards for Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Comedy Series four times in 1984, 85, 86, 
and in 1989, and that was up against some pretty formidable opposition, the Golden Girls, the Murphy Browns, some really, really, um, really, really strong years for TV comedy. There's no question, Rhea Perlman as Carla Tortelli is a national treasure. That leaves us with this. Does Cheers age well? Answer that for yourself by watching a few episodes with someone from another generation. Because depending upon your age, you either see a romance that evolves between a barmaid and her boss as problematic, or you don't. Or that when you watch that romance blossom from the lewd, entitled persistence of said boss, well, that may or may not make you cringe. So maybe it started as a small part, or maybe it was planned that way, that whole notion that the story arc was going to be the growing love between Sam and Diane. But regardless of whether that was the intention, it was totally acceptable for the day, and I honestly today see no reason to watch any more Cheers. And I'll have you know that some of us still carry the flag of utter disgust that General Hospital transformed Luke and Laura to a romantic power couple status, when in fact, that relationship began with him raping her, all to the tune of Chuck Mangione's Feel So Good. Come to think of it, I should consider designing the flag of utter disgust for possible future podcast merchandise. Because I can. So until I go full online retail, please head to tvherstory.com to subscribe to the free monthly newsletter check out our social media links. Many thanks to Mary Lou Morose for smoothing audio clips into this narration. Our music, as always, is Take Me Higher by Jazzer and can be found at freemusicarchive.org. I will leave you with this. As a baby boomer, I was raised. If I didn't have anything nice to say, I shouldn't say anything at all. But by golly, the day Norm Peterson denigrated his beloved wife Vera in public was the day we should have all learned that that whole adage of don't say anything at all, applies more to women than to men. And for us to see progress of any sort, as women, we sometimes have to say things that aren't nice. That is why I podcast. I'm your host, Cynthia Bemis Abrams.